also type them in at any time. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Women Empowered Wednesdays. Yeah. It's only the second Wednesday, but I think I have a good feeling about this. <laughs> we're getting the hang of it. We're we figuring are. It out. We're figuring this out. Thanks for joining us. Um, we had a, a really, what we felt like was a, a great discussion last week, and um, we just love the feedback and being able to connect with all of you. So we hope you all are doing well right now and are in a good place. Um, and if not, take a deep breath. Mm. Move yourself to a room, maybe where you can see sunlight, maybe away from noise or energy that might be somewhat frustrating or triggering, or put in some ear pods with some noise cancellation <laughs> abilities, um, and just try to be here with us. And if you can't, that's okay too. We welcome all of those things, but we are letting you know that we hope that you are advocating for yourself and intent setting a boundary Ooh, for your safe space. space. <laughs> Yes, that's the magic word of the day, is boundaries. We're going to go in depth. We talked a little bit about it last week, but we knew that it required... But you asked for more. Yes. <laughs> we knew it required a whole hour just dedicated to that, and probably more, to be honest. We'll be back talking more about this. Um, and as we mentioned last week, we are going to use some of the content in the Empowerment Handbook, um, which all of you have access to on graceuniversity.com. If you go to my content, my files, and you click on Women Empowered Handbook 2.0, um, it's all there. So we're gonna be using some of this stuff for reference, uh, but we're also just gonna kinda go deep into some discussion and also a great question that came in last week that we wanna make sure we get to. Um, so if you wanna join us on page 41, is kinda where the, the talk about boundaries comes in, and uh, I think a great place to start with boundaries is what is it? What is a boundary? What's a boundary? Yes. I like to look at boundaries as the end of me, but the beginning of you. And so that's kind of like whether that's a, a space bubble, or whether that's literal, figuratively, my body, your body, or whether that's like space, don't call me, don't contact me, don't come to my work. It's, it's, a, it's literally where I end and someone else begins. That's a great definition. And so you're saying we get to choose that. Oh, we, we get, get to define that. Where our space ends and the other person's begin. How, how beautiful. Uh, where where we, we're going to start off today is some of the misconceptions about boundaries, because I think that's always a good place to start, is why don't we set boundaries? And we're going to start a little bit more in the context of self-defense, because that's ultimately what we're talking about. But then we're going to go into deep into what else are we defending ourselves against in life, right? Um, besides a potential predator, somebody that is trying to hurt us. Because just in general, boundaries, as Brene Brown says, is the highest form of self-love. Yes. So sometimes that means that it doesn't have to be some crazy, ridiculous situation. It could just be defending yourself from yourself, from your thoughts, from maybe loved ones around you who have all good intentions. And we're going to get to that, but we're going to start here. But I just want to know that that's like a beautiful spectrum that we're going to hit today. Mm -hmm. Great to find that. So one of the first misconceptions, I think, and one of the main reasons why a lot of people are hesitant in setting boundaries is that they might feel that in order to be a good person, they must be polite to everyone around them at all times, including strangers. Mm. And this is generationally kind of passed down and, and nurtured in a lot of environments as females in general, like to be a good girl, to be polite to smile, mm -hmm. to, um, to be kind, always say please and thank you. We are somewhat habituated and programmed into this ideology that the better human we are, the better woman we are, the more we're liked, the more we're seen, maybe the more successful we are. And this has been a nurturing for our biggest misconception. For sure. And it, yeah, it comes down to wanting to be liked, ultimately. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us believe that our worth is defined by how well liked we are in our communities and in our world. And that's... Um, you know, simply not true. Now, and, and, and it's also not true that the people who set boundaries are not liked, right? That mm -hmm. might be a little bit of a misconception. So let's talk about that, right? So the, um, the idea that if you set a boundary, you will be looked at as rude or impolite. And also just this idea, like we said, the fact that you're, it's your obligation to the world to be polite to everybody. And first of all, it's not, right? Um, but second of all, when, especially when we talk about our safety. That is really what, what we're looking at here. Is it nice to be kind to others and polite and to that to be your natural disposition? Sure, right, if that feels good for you. Uh, but when it comes to our safety, 
that's when our priorities have to change immediately. Yeah. So when it comes, yeah, when it comes to safety, basically screw politeness is what we're saying. <laughs> Forget politeness because this is where we have to listen to our intuition and our gut. Yeah. And if our gut is telling us that something is not safe or somebody is not safe or somebody is trying to cause us harm and we are not um, listening to that and we're not responding because we have now prioritized how they might feel about us setting a boundary with them over our own gut feeling, over our own safety uh, and consideration for ourselves and our, and our safety, then that's a problem. And if you feel like you weren't accepted because you did set a boundary, you're not crazy. There are a lot of people who have some discomfort with hearing no. A lot of men have been raised to feel like, well, this is, you are, I can do this to you. This is normal. This is a program behavior. There's almost a social agreement that this is okay. So you're not crazy for being like, well, if I say, say no, they're going to think I'm rude. Yeah, they're going to try. These are tactics, which we'll get to, that they use to kind of debilitate the, the discernment of whether that boundary is in fact okay. So you're not crazy, but we are advocating for you to strengthen that um, muscle and to, to say, I don't care that you think I'm rude. Actually, my, I'm worth defending, and this is okay. And it doesn't make you rude. That's the other part of it. Correct. That, right? It's, it's the perception. Like, it's you're not perception. rude. Um, you are not, and and uh, I think I know you mentioned Brene Brown. She is a, a wonderful resource to go to when mm -hmm. talking about boundaries because she really reframes it in a way where you understand that boundaries is, is just about love, and actually you can be more generous and more compassionate yeah. and more giving to people around you when you have clear, clear boundaries instead of the opposite. Whereas you feel like okay, I have boundaries, no one can get in. It's actually the opposite. When you have clear boundaries, you go, come on in, and then you go, oh, but then I, I know exactly where, again, where you end and I begin. Yeah. And that could be overwhelming if you've never done this before, but this is just, again, the first misconception. Mm -hmm. The second misconception is that it can be embarrassing, and you might feel like overreacting, and that, that might feel yucky, so you don't want to do it. And here's the thing. When you set a boundary, if anyone makes you feel embarrassed for setting that boundary, they are not on your team. They are team, not you. So they are completely, um, what's it called, plowing over the boundary and making you feel embarrassed. And you don't have to feel embarrassed to set a boundary. That's not something that I think anyone should feel. That's right. We talked about that last week, how boundary is also a tool for us to just know people's intentions. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it's very clear, if I set a, an effective boundary with somebody, their response will tell me everything about their level of respect for me. Yeah. So if I set a boundary with somebody, and they may try to make me feel embarrassed for setting it, or make me feel like I overreacted. Um, and especially if you think about a self-defense situation, mm -hmm. right? Where a man's approaching you, and you do set a boundary. You set a physical boundary, maybe a verbally assertive boundary, you tell him to back up, and then he, makes you feel like you're crazy oh, or that you're oh, oh, yeah. so embarrassed. That is that is exactly what they're what they're gonna try to do, right? And that does has no indicator of whether they were actually a threat or not. Yeah. So sometimes we can feel like, oh gosh, maybe overreacted, maybe this man didn't actually, you know, wasn't an actual threat. But the truth is we don't know that. We never will know that. Um, so we just have to listen to our gut and we have to just be okay with the the fact that this person may respond poorly to this, and they may not yeah. like the fact that I set a boundary with them, um, or that I kind of called them out on their behavior. And the more accepting we get of that, and the more we trust ourselves to be able to do that, and, and trusting our judgment on that, um, the more we'll likely be okay with any type of reaction and not feel embarrassed. Uh, and it's also okay to feel, like, it's okay to feel that afterwards. It's gonna be a part of this process. Like, when you set a boundary and there's a, there's a response, there might be a natural response of embarrassment or shame or guilt, yeah. especially guilt. And, and again, especially with women, it is this, the thought of like, oh gosh, I, 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 may, I upset him. Yeah. And, I, you know, did I, should I have upset him? Now he's mad. It's my fault. Right? So really coming to terms with that and recognizing that it's not our job to just make everybody's day go however they, they want it to go. Right? It's our job to protect ourselves straight up. And there, it's likely that any high intensity reaction from the man who is in fact the perpetrator of the situation and doesn't have good intentions, his escalated response is not only indicative of his intentions, but a compensatory response to now have to um, counterbalance what you're giving to still maintain his sense of power. Mm -hmm. So once we understand the psychology of why he's responding the way he is, we can then maybe not take it so personal on our side of like, oh, oh, this guy's just trying to gaslight me and make me think that I shouldn't feel embarrassed for the fact that he totally plowed my boundaries.
But this is about him, not about me. Correct. Yes. Which, secret to life, most everybody's reactions, if they're big, small, even if they're filled with love, have to do a lot with their state of being, not as much about you. Mm -hmm. But again, that's still something I'm internalizing, so I can preach it all day long, but I'm still figuring it out myself. We're all figuring it out. <laughs> we are not experts in any of this by any means. We're, we're sharing our journey. journey. Our journey, yeah, our journey with you as well. Yeah. Um, I think the next misconception, especially when it comes to self-defense, is the idea that verbal assertiveness may cause, uh, may, may increase danger or cause more aggression on behalf of the you know perpetrator. Yeah. So that so the thought that if somebody, and we always kind of use the example of you know pretty much the sketchiest situations we can all think about, which is late at night, it's dark, you're by yourself, a gas station, right, or outside of a grocery store. We've all been there, right? Oh, and yeah. or at least you've dreamt it. But yeah, well, we've all been there. Whether really the threat was there or not, right. we've all felt that feeling of like, this is this feels a little sketchy. And if somebody were to approach me, this would, you know, this would not be ideal. Yeah. Um, whether the person actually did or not, right? But if somebody does approach you, uh, the thought might be, well, okay, if I just ignore them. And if I just keep my eyes down here or just go about my business, they'll go about their business and you know, I, I won't bother them, they won't bother me. And that might be the, the, the misconception there about setting a boundary, especially with like a stranger or somebody who's potentially dangerous. And uh, did you ever know that when you're a little kid and there's a monster hiding in the closet and if you just stay in your bed and the, the monster is still there, you'll always get scared about it? Or you go to the closet, open it up and be like, there's a monster! So what I is see you, monster? I see you! <laughs> That's kind of what I feel like when it comes to these things is you have to call it out. Hey, why are you doing so close to me? Like, what, what is your deal? Hey, I see you. And calling them out and being verbally assertive, it feels awkward because if they in fact have good intentions, they're like, what's up? <laughs> they almost feel like, what's going on? Well, it's a good lesson for them to be yes. honest, right? Like, stop breathing! <laughs> they, they may not be aware that what they're doing is making somebody feel unsafe, but guess mm -hmm. what? You can teach them that. <laughs> and they should know this, that they probably shouldn't approach a woman who's by herself at a gas station pumping her, 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 her gas. Um, but the other thing is to think about is you always have to think about what, what would their ideal situation be. So assuming that they have bad intentions, mm -hmm. right? If, I, if there's a man who does have bad intentions and who does mean me harm, what would his, his ideal response from me be? And his ideal response would actually be me ignoring him. And it would be allowing him to get as close as possible yeah. to me, undetected and unaddressed. So when you think about what their objective is, if, especially, again, if, if, assuming that they, they, they would mean us harm, we have to just think about how do we defeat that objective? How do we make this a headache for them? And so, number one, somebody where, where they recognize, oh, I'm detected, right? So just simple eye contact. Um, and then ver the verbal assertiveness, right? The distance management, which we all talk about in the Stop Lock Frame class in Women Empowered, uh, but we're, and we practice that. But just that idea of like, okay, now she's creating physical distance, she's verbally asserting herself. All we're thinking in the mind are these are more and more obstacles that I don't really wanna, I don't really wanna approach right now. And so we're just creating more obstacles, more boundaries for them to have to cross in order for them to carry out whatever it is they may, may or may not have planned. Um, so the, 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 Reality of that is verbal assertiveness is one of our most powerful tools. Our voice is one of our most powerful tools when it comes to self-defense. And they do not they do not want somebody who is setting a physical boundary, who's creating space, whose hands are up, who might be even drawing attention to the fact, and you're telling them, sir, I need you to back up. And the, <laughs> se the second that you can do that, and I even like to like use like polite uh, language, but just like Wow, like give it to them. Like talk to them like they're a bad dog. But um but Please back up. Yeah. Please back up. <laughs> but I actually um one of one of our students had told us that she when she did that to a man and she said, Sir, I need you to back up, he he immediately thought she was a cop. Like the way she talked to him, he was like, Oh shoot, that's right. So you, you need to have that kind of authority. You can use that kind of authoritative voice, um, and you should, because you're talking about this person's right to come close to you. So being able to you know, tap into that and they will res respond, they, they, they will respond to that. Um, and that's not something that they wanna to continue to pursue. Um, now, that being this said- This is a very thin line, Eve. Yes, that being said, I think most people need that talk. Most, mo I would say most people, and unfortunately, specifically mostly women, yeah. need that talk of it is okay to be verbally assertive. It's okay to look someone in the eye and be direct and be clear about what you want from them. But but there is a line. And I think that there's other, maybe a smaller population, but there is a population out there that just get, can, can 
can be aggressive, right? So this misconception is the thought that the more verbally aggressive you are, the better. So this is where we have to just kind of look at a whole different dragon, which again, it, not for us to, to like control or deal with, but for us to be aware of how can we approach these situations with our authoritative um, voice, but not exacerbate to a point where we are now out of control in a situation of danger. Right, and a big part of that comes down to distance management, right? Yeah. A huge part of that, like the, our goal, what is our goal? Our goal is to neutralize the threat and to get to safety. Yeah. That is That's our right. goal. And a big part of that is keeping distance. It might be your hands up. It might be showing that, again, that, that, that assertiveness is okay, but when it becomes aggressive, and now when those, those hands turn to fists, and now when you get close in their face, and, and guess what, they may do something that makes you extremely angry. And that's where I've seen this happen. And there's been these unfortunate cases of women who got so angry, and rightfully so, yeah. that the person did something completely disrespectful to them. And they got so angry, they got in this person's face, this man's face, and started calling them names. And, and I understand that anger. But then, unfortunately, what happened is that that person did not kind of adhere to the, the, the ideals that, that you know, this person thought existed, which is that men don't hit women, or men won't, won't hit a woman. Even yeah, if some will. Say, some will. And there have been cases where um, this is exactly what happened, and then the man did become violent, yeah. right? So there is this, this, this threshold, we'll call it, threshold, and, and really that's, that's the difference. It's aggression versus assertiveness, right? You can be assertive, you can be direct, and you can be clear um, without having to you know, raise that level of, of violence, and, and we say fight fire with fire, with fight fire with fire, we want to fight it with water, and we've all got the water to, to lend to these situations. Yeah, and that's what many of you have been learning in the Women Power program is when, when it is we need to actually turn on the fire, when it is we actually have to turn it down, neutralize, add more water, it's all about conserving our energy, managing the distance, and getting to safety. And that is one of the big differences for many of you who haven't tried the Women Empowered program that we found in our program that we had a hard time finding elsewhere is that we are trying to just get be safe. A lot of places are going to show you to fight back at all costs. And we do agree that if, if it's a life or death situation and you do have to fight back in order to live, absolutely. But again, our goal is to get to safety and to stay alive at all costs. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means like you might deep down want to be like, oh, I'm okay. so angry, I'm gonna make this guy pay and I'm gonna give it to him and I'm gonna tell him exactly how I feel. And we should have the right to do that, right? Absolutely. But when it comes down to our safety, again, that's where we just go prioritize and say, yeah. is it worth me telling this guy off? Or am I more important than all of this? And my safety more important than all of this? And so just kind of having that perspective there. Um, and I think also when it comes to self-defense, just re remembering this idea of escalation, you know? Escalation is good up until that certain point. And, you know, when we're, and we talk about this in our stop block frame class, but it's the idea that we can start with a simple boundary, we can start down here with, with whatever you feel comfortable with in terms of setting boundaries with people. Yeah. And that comfort level is different for everyone. And that's why we practice it in our classes, right? And it might be, excuse me, sir, stop right there. That might be your, your physical boundary setting that you're saying. Right? And it's very clear, you're at, telling him to stop if he's coming closer to you. And then what happens? He either takes a step forward, or he goes, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, man, I didn't, I didn't see you there. And he goes the other way. You go, great. I don't know what his intentions were. He could have been the creepy guy that was, had bad intentions or not. Who doesn't, doesn't even matter at that point. Right? Yeah. But if he takes one more step, that's when then we have the opportunity to escalate. And we create more distance. And we say, sir, I said, stop. Back up. And now we can look at him directly. And now we're causing, you know, drawing attention to the scene. So developing those tools and, and kind of having you know, the script ready for yourself, if you're not somebody who feels natural when it comes to setting those type of boundaries, you have to practice it. We all have, um, and this is a big part of what, why we ask our students to verbally say these words and practice with each other, because it doesn't come natural for everyone to put your hands up and to use your bad dog voice, right? And what's crazy is it comes really natural for me to do that. I'm like, back up, let's do this. The problem is then this. I don't feel natural saying that to a family member or a friend mm -hmm. or to someone that I'm a little close to. And that's when we start to talk about the spectrum of when we should use these big voice behaviors and when it should be a little more subtle. Or even now, I have two little girls, four and seven now, they're just seven. I'm not gonna treat my seven-year-old like, back up, get off me, I'm working on my computer. <laughs> it comes out that way. <laughs> of course, we all have that in us. But my, my point is that setting boundaries doesn't always have to be some big voiced like affair. It can be very deeply like, ah, you know what? This isn't working for me right now. 
you're going to change. And that's just understanding the spectrum of which we want to understand who we're setting the boundary with, like what, what are the means in which I can get my result, like the result that I want, and am I going to be able to express that effectively? Mm. And that's, that, that's the hardest thing I think for most of us is how can I express it effectively? If I'm naturally one that leans towards just boldness, it's, it's a lot harder for me to create that soft gentility for a family member who is totally running my boundaries. And, and I hate to even go further with this, it actually started because I didn't set the boundaries sooner mm -hmm. with kindness. Because in, in outside situations with all else stranger, I'm like, don't touch me, don't talk to me, keep back. Like it's very simple for me to draw these lines. But when it's people who I care about, because I actually, I love Eve and I'm like, I want my family members' approvals and my friends' approvals, I'm less likely to set these boundaries. Mm -hmm. I'm more likely to say, okay, whatever well, works for you. I turn into people pleaser mm -hmm. like Victoria, and then I get trampled on, and then what happens? I get pent up inside. All this anger gets like waiting, waiting, and then the wrong person comes <laughs> in and then I'm back. I'm angry, I'm so have been in this experience, A, because it's very normal, B, because I've heard a lot of stories of this happening, but I don't set the boundaries, they're, they're making me feel this way, and then I enraged on them. This happens with our children, this happens with family members that we love, mm -hmm. friends, co-workers, etc. And that's why the spectrum is really important. It is. And I think it's easier to start with the strangers, right? Like mm -hmm. that's why we kind of started to talk with that. With like the self-defense, we all can get behind that. All right, right. somebody needs us harm, we get to set a boundary with them, we can yell at them, we can say whatever we want to yeah. keep, keep ourselves safe. It changes a little bit when that when that um, you know the spectrum changes. And so the spectrum is based on a few different things. One is your familiarity and your level of closeness mm -hmm. with that person, like you said. But the other part of the spectrum is maybe even the perceived power that this person may have in your life. Uh, we talked a little bit about this last week as well. Yeah. Um, and what we found is that the, 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 more, the closer somebody is to you, basically the, the more familiar you are with them, the harder it is to set the boundaries. Sure. And at the same time, the more uh, this person kind of has some like perceived, uh, perceived power over you in a situation, the more difficult it is. And the, the reason why it could be harder for someone who's closer to you is because you feel like there's more to lose. If mm -hmm. I set this boundary, I could lose this relationship that's really important to me. And similarly with power, if I set this boundary with someone in power, that could mean that I lose my job and mm -hmm. or go to jail or like whatever the power paradigm is, they're going to exert that power on you so you're less likely to push against it. Mm -hmm. So that being said, um, let's talk about some strategies that then mm -hmm. because Ultimately, what we need is strategies, and what we are very aware of is that it's not going to look the same for everyone because that spectrum is so so different, and because uh, we're going to set boundaries differently with our children than we are with a um, you know a drunk guy at a gas station. Uh, I we hope. have to have we just have <laughs> some strategies and different tools to pull yeah. from. So we're going to talk a little bit about some strategies. We're, we'll start with one that we mentioned last week, and just because it's such an important one, and it's kind of like. You know, if I had to teach them one a person one thing, it would be this one because it's kind of the big, it's the most clear. And really, when it comes to boundaries, clarity I would say is key. Yeah. Uh, and the three-part statement. The three-part statement, right? And so the first part is the behavior that is occurring. You state the behavior. You state how it makes you feel, and then you state the desired outcome. Mm -hmm. So if uh, the example I think we used last week, or or any example, you know, when you continue to hug me at work, it makes me feel uncomfortable, and like you don't respect me. I'd like you to stop. Right? Yeah. So it's very clear. The, the, the behavior is hugging. Um, how it makes me feel is disrespected or uncomfortable, and I would like you to stop hugging. Okay, yeah. so very, very clear exactly what it is, and you can say clarity is key. So that three part statement can be used in a multitude of situations. Um, like and mom, I really, um, when you grab the phone from my hand without asking, it makes me feel like you don't respect this electronic. I would like you to never pull that from my hand again. And that's a lot easier than saying, don't pull that for me, give it back. Mm -hmm. And then you pull it right back, and then you're literally displaying and exhibiting the behavior you're trying to stop. Love it. And you're setting a great model for your children of how to set boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> so that three-part statement, we, we wanted to bring it up again because it's so good. It's, it's very clear. But we also recognize that there will be situations where it might feel hard to pull that out. Mm -hmm. and, and we also want to give everyone the grace of knowing that 
Um, it's okay if you don't feel comfortable setting a boundary with somebody because of Basically, it's survival, right? Yeah. We're, we're all just trying to survive. We're trying to survive our job, our workplace, our living environment. We're trying to make things, we're trying to make things as simple as, as and easy as possible for us. We want to get past survival. We want to get thriving. In order to do that, we have to build that foundation of like none of this can happen, so that I can actually thrive up here, yes. right? Um, yeah, no, exactly. Threat, survival is kind of the base, right? And then thriving goes beyond that. Um, but we're, we're all in survival right now. We're all, yeah, we are, we are. We're all in survival. And sometimes that's just, okay, what's the bare minimum I gotta do to get through with this? And that's okay too. We don't need you to feel like you have to be this like master boundary setter and you're just like, boom, putting up shields to everyone around you. Um, we, we understand that each <laughs> gonna, we, yeah, but, but uh, they, that there's gonna be some nuances with every interaction. And we wanna give you just different tools so that you don't feel like, oh, I've only got one option. And, and it's the same self-defense, right? If we only taught you how to I grab somebody, you know, how to uh, I grab somebody's eyes out, uh, and that's the only tool we gave you, then in a situation where you know you didn't give other kind of scalable options for boundary setting too. Yeah. And um, so some of the, some of those strategies, right? One is humor. And I'm not very funny, so that doesn't work for me. You are. <laughs> you know, <I'm> not. <laughs> not with those people. Let me tell you, like, oh. Yeah, but I, but I think that um, I think it can be done in a way where it's like, okay, everyone gets the hint, ha ha ha, you know. But <laughs> I'm you not touching me. Yeah, I, I had to use this when I worked at WWE a lot. Like yeah. that was because I I recognized I worked in a male dominated industry. I had to see these people every single day, and I actually watched. Um, you know, one story I shared. I actually watched a specific man who I worked with just berate this woman um, who I also worked with on mm -hmm. national television because he was essentially felt turned down by her. He was kind of hitting on her and she rejected him. This is not, it didn't happen on screen. And then on screen he got a chance and he just berated her on, on national television. She was the interviewer. And I watched it happen. And then I actually was rooming with her that night and she was in tears just the entire night and she quit right, right away. Mm. And I watched that happen and I just, I just, my heart went out to her. I felt so sad, but I also watched that happen. And then guess who his next, um, you know, target was? It was me. I was also new. And so now I'm like, I, again, I'm into survival mode. I, I said, I have to set boundaries with him, but I gotta be careful because I, I don't want that to happen to me. I want, yeah, I want to keep my job. I want to be able to thrive in this environment and not feel scared yeah. like, I, by, by this person. And, and, and your reputation. And well, for sure. So, I chose the route of humor. So I kind of came up with these like jokes with him to basically like, ha, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. And he um, and he actually responded well to it. You know, he still would like throw something, he would, he would throw something and see if it sticks every once in a while, and it didn't, and it never did, and then he stopped. Yeah. You know, so I was able to recognize that this is not, a, that may not have been a situation where I could have effectively used a three-part statement and felt like it was the safest thing for me to do in that situation. That's okay. And that's what we're saying is that there's other ways, as long as you accomplish what your goal is, and that's it. For me, it was just, I didn't want to keep, I want to keep my job. I want to keep smiling. Yeah. I don't want to feel scared by this person who I have to now see every day. Who I recognize has been here way longer than me. Yeah. They're not going to, you know, no one's going to care, to be honest, um, if I speak up about this. So I had to do what I, what I had to do in order to stay safe for myself. And I, I would argue that humor is one of the tenderest on the male ego, and anyone's ego really. So sure. if you feel like you are in a situation where this person's ego is constantly triggered and you can notice that, humor is kind of your go-to for that. It, it's, it's, it's tender. Uh, unlike my the next <laughs> tactic, which is being a very candid and blunt response, is no. And similarly, I was on tour with lots of people in my life as well, and on one particular tour for me, a guy came up right behind me and full hand grabbed my butt. And I literally did not have it in me to make a joke. I turned around it, like collar checked his neck, and I was like, don't ever touch me like that again. And he shook, he was shook. And he tried to use humor to de-escalate his own shame and embarrassment. But I, did, I didn't have a joke for that. There was already, the boundary was breached, my physicality was grabbed, and I said, no, this can't, I, I, I needed to set a precedent for not only myself because I was going to rage on him, but I wanted to keep my job, and I was clear, and there was all these other dancers who I was the captain of, and I was the role model for, and I was like, oh my gosh, like I can't let this happen. Mm -hmm. this, this situation needs to be done in front of his peers, in front of my peers, and everyone needs to see that this can't happen with these women on this tour. And it was, it was a hard moment, 
but I, ha I had to do it, and then I waited, and I was ready. Like, I don't know what's gonna happen. <laughs> but luckily, he bowed, and it was quite beautiful. And I think he was subsequently fired as well after that for some other stuff, which is karma. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yes. And just along those same night, like there might be a physical, like an actual physical self-defense set setting that you need to do, mm -hmm. right? And that's also a way to set a boundary. And that was similar. Like she checked in, she pushed him. Um, which brings me to me to another story. <laughs> We're getting all the goods today, guys. <laughs> of uh, another person that I worked with in that world, mm -hmm. and he was really drunk when I. And I, it was a little bit still like that initiation phase for me when I was still new. And we were all overseas, and he just kept like trying and, 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 and trying to like play wrestle. And he knew I, I had only been training jiu jitsu for maybe, I want to say, three months, four months at the most. Yeah. Was, like, I was like a baby. I was like, I was like, blue belt was like a couple strikes in. But as soon as he started, I was like, oh, I'm going to lose my. Okay, not, not giving advice, by the way. I'm not advocating to try this. this. But I was like, oh, because he knew I was trained. So he was like, oh, let me see some of that jiu jitsu. And I just like, it was like a full on bar fight at that point. I was like, oh, I'm going to. And it, I ended up with a black eye, but I also choked him out unconscious in front of everybody. Um, and I was still like a backstage interview at the time. So I was like, uh-uh, I'm not going to. And I sunk it in and held it, and he passed out, started snoring, and everyone saw him. They're just like, you just got choked out by a girl. And um, all that by the way, that yeah, also, yeah. of course, I was like, oh, my God, I'm not going to lose my job. But no, I like basically got promoted after that. <laughs> uh, get in the ring. <laughs> But it was it was another one where like then I just had this unspoken thing where like nobody messed with me after that and I, like sometimes you do have to set the precedent of like no nope, I'm not gonna deal with that I'm not gonna I'm not the one she's not the one uh, and and we're saying with all the little again we're not advocating they go around choking people out or getting bar fights yeah <laughs> <laughs> looking back probably not a smart thing and there may have been other ways I could have handled it it happened to work out. In my I actually think it was it's exactly nice. the way that she could have handled it, yeah. and I advocate for you finding the best way that works for you, which is why we have another tactic, which is to state your preference. Yeah. What is your preference? You know, I prefer you not grab my butt. Instead, I would prefer you shake hands with me. That one did not warrant the state preference. <laughs> yes. But I'm sure that there are lots of situations that might. Right. And and that's a great example. Like I think this one is best used for the hug example. Um, where somebody's always giving you hugs and it just became this thing. You're like, you know, I prefer handshakes. Mm. And that's just, now you're just talking about your preference. I prefer handshakes. And you can extend your hand. And it's just very clear, right? You didn't say anything about, there, there was no three-part statement. It was just a very clear statement of what you prefer. And that's okay, too. So you can just state, here's what I prefer. And then, especially if it's like something where you feel like this person is to be willing with willing to kind of go along with um like still wants to maintain a good relationship with you and just didn't really recognize that they were crossing a boundary that's a great tool to use yeah and that state of preference is kind of borderline with me with like i give myself an identity i'm not a hugger and you can start to say at work i'm not a hugger guys nobody hugs with you it's not my thing so state of preference can be person to person or kind of like a global mask you take on while you're at that work environment or while you're at that family environment like guys stop hugging me i'm not a hugger in this family okay mm -hmm. just because you might have to do that sort of outer layer self-defense in case there is a family member or a family friend who makes you uncomfortable and you want to like globally say okay everyone back up because he doesn't know how to back up so everyone's gonna have to back up for a while that's right uh the next one is basically separating their intentions from their actions. So this is, again, this might be used for somebody in actually a very genuine way. Or you might go, you know what? I actually think my coworker thinks that this is flattering to me, but it's not, and it creeps me out, and it, and it feels disrespectful, yeah. whatever it is, right? So you might be able to have a talk with this person and say, you know, I think that by telling me how I, that I look really nice in my, my outfit every day, that you're trying to, um, you know, make a connection with me or trying, trying to be, yeah, trying to compliment me, um, maybe you're trying to be nice, but I actually don't take it that way. And instead, it makes me feel, um, you know, like uh, this is not a professional relationship. So I would prefer that you, you know, if you want to make compliments, you do it about my work, you do it about anything else. I, I don't want you to make comments about my outfit or how I look anymore. So we started off with kind of giving them the benefit of the doubt, saying, you know, I think that you mean well by this. However, I'm, you know, this is not how I perceive this. Um, or this is not how it's being received. And the benefit of this too is you're not kind of educating him as well. Of like, in general, this women don't respond well to that. Maybe you think that they do, but this is not the ideal way to connect with somebody or one of your coworkers or to compliment them. So let me give you another tool that does work, right? And this has actually come up even in our instructor certification program where some of the instructors were like, oh, we call these um, women 
and they have these interesting, I don't want to call them pet names, but they're kind of like certain names that they're like, well, that's what we say to them. They're this, this, or that. And like, um, actually, no. No, we prefer ladies or women. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. It's like, there's so many examples of this yes. where you can basically say, oh, okay, it sounds like you're trying to do this. However, so you're separating their intentions from their actions. And that, again, is a way for them to A, save face, B, kind of, can, you know, uh, be able to continue a relationship and also see to educate them a little bit about their behaviors and how other people may may take it. And their commentary may be coming, again, from that good place. And they just may not be culturally hit to the fact that those things are offensive. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Or derogatory, whatever. Um, and if you, yeah, and if you are having trouble with that, our next suggestion is to get support. And that might be in a work environment, going to HR. That might be at home if you're if you're having trouble setting boundaries, you might have to go to your spouse and say these kids are are running the ship. I need you to hold them back so I can get I can breathe. And might be at your jujitsu school, you go to your head instructor and say, hey, there was somebody I trained with who made me feel uncomfortable, and I don't know how to address them. Right. So getting support, getting external support, is yeah. another way to set boundaries. That's okay. And there might be a, a multitude of reasons why you decide to get support, and that you don't either feel safe or comfortable addressing that person directly. Yeah, and if you don't feel safe addressing that person directly and it starts to happen, our last and probably one of the most important ones is just physical separation. Being willing to walk out of a situation and just walk away. And that might feel weird, again, when it comes to the spectrum. If it's a person in power, someone you know really well, you might feel strange just going, I don't like this, and walking away. I actually feel uncomfortable leaving any, like what I call an unclosed string, as, because I'm like, but I, I need to finish, we need to close this book. But no, if it's starting to make me feel uncomfortable now, I can just be like, no, this doesn't work for me. I don't know why, it's making me feel weird, I need to walk away. And we are telling you that this is one of your options as well. That is a great option. And here's the, this is not the end of the options, right? So <laughs> anything that works on the fly, anything that you just pull out of your back pocket, yeah. anything you can pull from your tool, from your tool belt at any point. Um, if you guys have others that you guys use, feel free to add them here and then we'll kind of add it to our arsenal in terms of when these discussions come up. But um, you know, whatever you need to do to basically Make it, you know, establish a boundary and keep yourself safe, you know, and, and, and always listening to your kind of gut when it comes to what's best for you in any situation. There's not yeah. one right answer or one right way to set a boundary. Now, we've given you a bunch of boundary options and settings and techniques, but know that there's one thing that is almost like prescription, like how it's going to go down, mm -hmm. and that's you're going to get some type of pushback. Mm -hmm. Almost always, especially if the intentions are not good. And um, I'm going to give some warning here because on Instagram Live, they stop us at one hour. Oh, got it. And on YouTube, they let us go. Got it. Thanks, YouTube. Thanks, YouTube. <laughs> so if you are following us on Instagram Live, um, I did post on my story um, on my page that Gracie, and, and we didn't post it on Women in Power, but it's on Women in Power too. Oh, it is. Yeah. So there's a YouTube link there. So if this ends on Instagram for you in 20 minutes, just know that we might still keep going on the other mm -hmm. one. And I just want to let you know that. But let me go back. Yes. So, when any boundary is set, it's a very high chance that you're going to get a pushback. And when it comes to pushbacks, men have been, and I don't, it's not just men, women, we're all pretty creative on the ways that we can push back. One of them is questioning your behavior. And you can, this is where like, we start to go, uh, wait, wait. when they question us, we start to question ourselves. Yeah. I'm like, wait a minute, yeah. is, that, is that not okay? Like, am I okay with this? Why, why is that? Am I overreacting? Yeah. Or, yeah. So questioning is one of the biggest pushbacks that if you can identify and go, oh, you're questioning my choice here. The, the key thing on pushbacks is to identify that they have to do something to defend their stance and their position. And if you can identify, oh, they're questioning me. But I'm so strong and rooted in my choice to defend my space and my boundary life that I can go, oh, you're questioning me. I get it. I still stand true to what I feel. And that goes back to what we addressed last week, which is you don't actually have to have a reason. No. So they may ask for a reason or demand a reason or why are you doing this or what, what is your deal? And you can just simply say, this, that doesn't work for me. Just because. Or, just because. Or because I said so. Right? <laughs> so we don't actually need, uh, we don't need to write a novel on the reasons why this person should stop doing <laughs> what they're doing. You, you can offer that information if you feel like it's helpful, but if not, you say, it just doesn't work for me. I need you to stop. So I'll email, I'll email you about it later. <laughs> <laughs> what, okay. Yeah. So you, you don't actually need need a response. So they may ask for one, and you can just stay stay true. And because it doesn't feel good for me, doesn't work for me. Because yeah. I want you to stop. Because I don't just. That's it. Hiya. Yes. <laughs> um, and then another potential 
pushback, which is I think everyone's most um, biggest fear, and this was actually my biggest fear yeah. when, when I with my situation I talked about thank you. When I talked about earlier was retaliation. Mm -hmm. I saw I watched somebody retaliate against a, a, a woman who set a boundary with him and he basically turned him down because he was trying to hit on her and when he realized it wasn't going to go anywhere, he felt let on, whatever that might mean. So I was fearful of retaliation. Um, and retaliation is a real thing and it's a real, and it's, a, it's a valid concern for many Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Because retaliation could also not be overt. It could be very much like, oh, I'm going to get them fired. It could be subtle. It could be talking about behind your back in ways that now rumors are spread about you in ways that you didn't even know. Right. Which is what I want to talk about. Sure. Yeah. And, and this is, I think when it comes to retaliation, this is where really um, just seeking support. You're going to yeah. need support. If you fear that retaliation will happen, you will need support. You will need somebody. You will need to talk to somebody about what happened, about how it went down. Um, support is key when it comes to retaliation because you will need somebody on your team. Uh, and we hope that you feel like you can find somebody in, in that type of situation. Um, but also you can you can stay strong in, in, in the belief that like I have very strong beliefs in karma and in, in, in the belief that like if I am speaking my truth if I'm talking from a true place and I and I and I really understand why I did what I did then I have less fears about moving forward with that you know mm -hmm. and I think that I, I I'll, I'll be standing on a stronger base when it, when somebody does try to retaliate against me later. And so, so part of that is finding our own foundation and finding our own base and finding support around us in case we need them. Yeah, I think one of the things that I've experienced a heavy amount of is the trivializing. Mm. So it's very much like I come with the boundary, I'm like, hey, that doesn't make me feel good. And I explain why, and I do the three-part statement with not that much assertiveness, but just calm. And then it's like, what do you mean? It's just this. It's, mm -hmm. I'm, just, I'm just talking to you. Oh, I'm just giving you a, oh, it's just a hug. And so they don't flatter yourself. Right. right. And they trivialize what I feel to be something that's really important to me. And that can be really um, confusing for a brain that's trying to like really hold a line when they say, oh, that line's silly. What are you doing? I'm like, uh, uh, uh. And the, the hardest part is if we've, if we've already had difficulty setting the boundary, the trivialization of one mm -hmm. can make it even harder to like hold that thing up. So it's actually desensitization. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough one for me, and I, it's one that I've known that I experience with actually strangely a lot of females. Mm -hmm. A lot of females, when I try to set the boundary, it's very much like, well, I don't understand why that's such a big deal to you. And I'm like, uh, I, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I don't know why, but it doesn't matter why it's a big deal to me, it just is. Because mm -hmm. the truth is, all of us have come with a lifelong of experiences that have created either positive or negative reactions. You can call them traumas, you can call them, um, triggers and these things that happen when they come up especially during boundary pushing you don't have to understand why it even bothers you the same way you don't have to give a reason to them why it bothers you you don't actually have to know why it bothers you in the moment now it would behoove you to go home and be like oh, why is it whenever i say this and they do that i really get this yucky feeling inside and journal and figure out something in yourself about it because then then you can come from a place of power, master it, and say, you know what? I now know why that bothers me so much, and I'm still not going to be okay with it. <laughs> you know what? So it, 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 there is some self-work to be done there, but the trivialization one is is a strange and interesting one for me. Yeah. And then I would say that the other ones that are very you know detrimental is like slander. So basically, somebody now making up lies about you, mm. and we see this a lot with with women who either yeah. kind of come come forward about their truths. Um, or who set strong boundaries, and now because the other person is in fact embarrassed, mm -hmm. they now create this alternate reality um, where they may make up lies, or they may try to slander your name, or or discredit your name so that what you are saying does not hold as much weight. Um, and yeah, it's it's a, it's another one that is, is is possible in terms of their reactions. And the reason why we're talking about these is because again, the more you can identify it, you go. It's almost like how you know, like, oh, I'm doing something right because they told me this was coming. And this is what happens. Like it's it's okay to like to know that this their response is not an indicator of the value of the boundary you set. As right. a matter of fact, it might actually be an indicator that it was exactly the right time to set a boundary, yeah. and that you actually really needed to set that boundary that you set. Yeah. Right. So slander, I would say, along that is humiliation. Yeah. So not just telling lies, but trying to humiliate you and trying to make a scene um, or to just. Yeah, basically to embarrass you based on, because ultimately, again, they're embarrassed. So they want to now embarrass you. Yeah, and that's why the, the majority of people who 
are, have bad intentions and when you set a boundary, they end up challenging them in these ways. And challenging your boundary is something that is considered a pushback as well. It's challenging, well, why? Why, why do you need to do that? That's asking for justification. It's challenging it and like, no, no, that's, that's not okay with me. Um, or, yeah, or they may even challenge you and say, oh, what are you going to do about it? Mm. Right? And they may actually, you may set a boundary and they may push further. And you're like, class five. You know what I'm saying? Right. And then, you know, honestly, that is like where your, your self defense may come into play. And so, you know, boundaries and verbal boundaries are our first line of defense. But yeah. if they continue to push to do that, then we have other physical boundaries that we can, we can, we can enforce to keep ourselves safe. So that's kind of, you know, some of the pushback that will happen. Now, we, we have kind of a general response that, that may, or may not work against this pushback. It's kind of nice. It's nice to be able to pull a tool and just like have a script and be able to say something. Yeah. You know when this happens. Um, and really, it comes down to identifying which one of those they just did. So I see you're trying to humiliate me because I set a boundary with you. I won't let you do that. The quicker you call it out, the quicker things are neutralized because they get caught. They then don't have that um, escalating of that tactic, and they can't keep using it because they got caught. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing to be able to sit here and say, yeah, oh, you want to use some humiliation to, to make me draw my boundary. That's cute. Right. And so that's, that's a great tool. It's, it's in the handbook as well. But basically, it's, I see what you're doing. You're doing X, Y, or Z, whichever one that they, whichever one that they, they chose, you know, humiliation, or you're trying to slander my name. That's not going to work um, for me. Yep, that's not going to work for me. Or I won't let you do that. And just like a simple statement like that. Yeah. So being able to call out what it is that, that they're doing and just staying strong in your stance. Uh, and you know we can't always we don't always know how how far it will go, but I you know there is a point where the person just kind of drops off, and so just believing in your right to do this is what will give you the foundation to be able to you know not only set your boundary to begin with, but to continue to stand strong to that boundary when they push back. And like we said, probably nine times out of ten they will push back. Yeah. And so expecting that and knowing that that's this is part of um, you know part of the process. And that it has no indicator of whether your boundary was in fact valid or not. Yeah, and um, because we're all stuck in quarantine with family members who may have inadvertently built up what I'll call behaviors of coping, and one of those might be boundary trampling, which might be difficult for you to coexist with. And if you are now in a place, a new place in your life, starting Women in Power, and you just figured out what a boundary was, and you're like, I want to set one, set one right now, and you're trying to set this with family members who have for many more years than you, than not been used to bound to trampling you, this is a, now a new behavior mm -hmm. for many, which can be very triggering for them. And if anything, brings up the challenging, oh, the, this is not the way it used to be. So you might find that setting um, boundaries as a new behavior with people who you've been friends with for a long period of time, living with for a long period of time, loving for a long period of time, it's one of the hardest change mechanisms because you You've lit literally written scripts for X amount of years saying, it's okay to treat me this way. And now you're changing the script. So the best way we can change that script is with the, this is a new behavior. You know, you used to make fun of me every time I would drop the dishes that way. And I used to find it funny, but it doesn't really resonate with me anymore. Can we, can we drop that joke? And it's a very kind, respectful request that, you know, they don't actually have to adhere to, but you're being very clear on your boundaries. This joke doesn't. It doesn't sit well with me anymore. I'd like it to stop. And you can do this with family members, you can do this with friends, coworkers, but this is this is the, the, the request for changed behavior. And again, if you haven't set boundaries in the past, it's never too late to set a new one. The the more streamlined you can set it in, kind of bring everybody to the rule book, it's like playing a game. Mm -hmm. The more everyone comes together and says, okay, we all agree upon these game, these rules of the game. Can you agree with me on this? Because this is what works for me. And that is a strong, there's a real strong reason why I do that with Henry. Ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> playing the game, he'll start making up rules. I'm like, uh uh, let's go back to the rule book here. You agree with that before? Six yes. And 12. So, yeah, it's just basically <laughs> setting the rules for engagement. And yeah. how beautiful to say, I can't wait to engage with you. But here are my rules, right? Here's the rules to engage with me. And then anything else goes. And that's why, you know, going back to like Brene Brown, like just, she has beautiful ways of expressing if you're, if you're still hesitant about this or feel like, Oh, but I'm gonna set up boundaries around me, and then that will make me less loved, or make it so that people, you know, um, don't respond well to me, or less liked. That there are ways you can set boundaries with so much love and consideration and care. And in matter of fact, it shows that you actually really value that relationship because you want it to succeed. You're literally saying, "Here is the rule book to how to succeed with me. Mm -hmm. Do you want to? Do you want to join me in this? And if they pick it up, it will be the most beautiful mm -hmm. relationship. Like this is how I can win with you. Here's how you can win with me. Let's win together. <laughs> I promise. Try that with any spouse, any partner, any friend. It's, it'll, and let us know how it goes. I love it. Um, do you want to go to that question?
first? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna just check on these questions on Instagram. So I'm gonna get awkwardly close. Okay. Don't <laughs> get scared. Um, there's some questions yeah. here. <laughs> Hold on. So actually, there's only a few. Um, oh, this is a beautiful one. How can one maintain healthy relationships with their peers in the BJJ studio regardless of attraction? Good question. Okay. This is um, interesting. So when you say attraction, I'm assuming you mean one-way attraction because if it was mutual, then maybe you can pursue it further. But if there is one person who is attracted to another and that person is enjoying that person's existence, but not necessarily wanting to pursue it further. The sooner you set that boundary, the more beautiful, the more better. And I've done it very subtly. I grew up being friends with tons of guys. I loved my guy friends. I had such a platonic appreciation for their energy, their ability to be my friend. And it was very clear. I would very much grow up things like, thanks friend. Oh my gosh, you're such a great friend. Thank you so hey, much. Bro. Bro. <laughs> It's totally, and I think there's nothing wrong with making it very clear, like, you know, I really appreciate that I can be friends with someone and have them not be pursuing me in a romantic gesture, even if they are, that you're not acting on that, because the feeling is not mutual, and I love that about you. Thank you. Right, I think that's a great, that's a great response. And also, um, again, I'm kind of making some assumptions too based on the question. Correct. But uh, if, if it is a situation where you feel like, you know, I have some peers in, in the jiu-jitsu world that I love as training partners, and you're worried that, oh, what if they start to, I feel like they may start having more like romantic feelings towards me. How do I approach the situation? Then I think that's where you can start, again, with like this, this feeling of like, you want to preserve this, you're setting a boundary, not because you're like, get away from me, right? Because you actually are like, I love having you as a training partner. I love having you in my life. And, and so being able to frame it with that and saying, you know, I appreciate you so much as a training partner and as one of my you know, jujitsu peers and buddies, um, I just really want to make sure, and you can decide when to, you know, at what point you want to do this, but I want to make sure you fully understand that I'm only seeking a friendship in this, mm. and I don't want anything beyond that. And so you're first kind of stating what you appreciate about the relationship, the fact that you do want to keep it, you know, salvaged, and, and then just making a clear boundary of what it is that you want from that relationship. Mm. And, you know, in hopes he might be crushed, but that's okay, right? And, and then you may go, oh, okay, all right, that's what this is. And... Um, and unfortunately, I wish that we could just have like, you know, my, it's, a lot of times as women, we feel like, well, when we're nice to people, that they think it's like this invitation for engagement or mm -hmm. further, furthering a relationship. And it's, it's, it's really unfortunate. And, and I feel all of you out there who have that, I, I remember for a long time, I felt like I couldn't make eye contact with people and with men because I just felt like it was, you know, some sort of invitation. But then you kind of learn how to do that in a way that it is, um, you know, comes from a place of like, oh no, I deserve to have male friends in this world, not I'm just here for your viewing pleasure, right, or whatever that might be. When you start having more belief in your value as a friend or as a training partner, when you actually fully believe, no, we can both win from this relationship, you're going to be more willing to, to speak on that and to say that. Yeah, and this is just a total personal belief situation on, on, the, on the situation here that I'm about to say is that I actually think that there is a deeper longevity with platonic relationships that can actually exceed the amount of time of romantic ones, let's say. So for any of you, either males or females, who are finding it like, oh, I'm crushed, the person I really enjoy spending time with doesn't want to date me, they might want to just be your friend forever. And that's a win too. So look at it from a, a different perspective of like, oh, okay, well, I don't necessarily have to date this person to appreciate them forever. They're awesome. Yeah. Cool. Great. We have one question. question. Yes. This is a question that came in last week, and it was very good. And I think for a lot of you um, jujitsu ladies out there, you will relate to a lot of these. Mm. So um, it's a little long, so I'll read it here. Um, because you uh, said, I had a question about setting boundaries with male training partners, especially upper ranks on the mat. Because jujitsu requires trust and respect in the people you train with, I find it difficult to find a voice when a training partner is displaying a disrespectful or intrusive behavior. Here are some examples. A male student squeezing the sides of my waist or hips with both hands and saying, good job, after every roll. Yeah. A new black belt walking over to me, the only female in the class, after just giving drill orders and saying, okay, princess, I'm going to walk you through this technique really slow so that you'll be able to keep up. Yikes. And later calling me baby girl in front of the class. Do you see the pet names I was talking about yes. earlier? Yeah, Ooh. Well, we'll get back to this. 
Um, unprompted, a higher-ranked male pulled me away from my drilling partner to show me a completely different technique than what the instructor had demonstrated and asked us to drill. Being interrupted and given advice by other students so frequently during drill time that I'm only able to get two reps in of one of the techniques during a five-minute period. This is only happening to the female players in the class, not the males. My question is, is there a phrase or verbal technique I can use to show the disruptive, intrusive individual that I respect their knowledge about jujitsu, but I need them to change their behavior? Does that does the state, state the behavior, state how it makes you feel, state the desired result method still work on that three-part statement we talked about? I never want to seem closed-minded to new information or techniques. How can I keep individuals that I want to learn from to treat me more respectfully in a keep it playful kind of way? Awesome. Great question. Thanks, Angel, for sending that in. Yeah. But, yeah. But, but, I actually like, want to go back to this because okay. there's so much here. Let's, Let's just pause one second. We have three minutes left on the Instagram feed. I just want to remind you guys again, if you are on Instagram watching, it's going to end, and we are going to address this really important question. So go ahead and move over to the YouTube link that is both in my page, Eve's page, and the Women Empowered page. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to say that one more time again, because it's going to end, and we're going to say goodbye. Yeah, and that'll be it. Okay. Right here. Um, so, yeah, great question. I think a lot of us can relate to, to these types of scenarios. Let's take it by um, um, Let's take it by well, yes. because it's so full of stuff. Well, it's a lot of it, it, a lot of it is similar, though, right? So the, the basic objective, because, and then, again, they have to think about what is her desired outcome in all this? And she said, I want them, I, I want to be able to gain information from these higher ranks that actually do know more than me. Like, yeah. we all love having training partners that can give us a few tips here and there, and that can help us help us train. So she wants to stay open to that, um, you know, that, that information, the flow of information from She's higher ranks. to learn. Exactly. And no, who better to learn from than higher ranks training partners, yeah. right? So that's the desired outcome. However, um, she wants to, she wants it to be done in a way that doesn't feel intrusive and, and or demeaning. And a lot of these behaviors do feel that way. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the one thing that, and you can t give me your, your thoughts on this as well, but for me, the one that, the kind of strategy that comes to mind for this is the one where we talked about kind of separating their intentions from their, from their actual behaviors. So this might be a conversation where you say, you know, I think you need to be, to create like an, an endearing, you may, you might be princess or baby girl as an endearing term, and you may, you know, think of me like a sister or a daughter or whatever that might be. But I actually kind of feel like it's a demeaning term. So I'd rather you, I prefer you call me by my name. Okay, so right then you're saying, you're giving them the benefit of the doubt. You're saying, you know, I think that by doing this, you might be trying to create some sort of form of endearment or term of endearment towards me that you might feel. However, when you say that to me, that's not how I interpret it. And so that is a, She's so nice. She's helping him say face. I'd be like, ha, 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 I'm not a princess. I'm a powerful woman. <laughs> and then I would just readjust. Now that might make him feel really awkward. And the truth yeah. is that is difficult on a space where they don't know what they're saying as something to me. I actually don't think that the majority of people who do this recognize how uncomfortable that really does make us. Baby girl. I'm not I'm not your baby girl. Mm -hmm. That's 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 not what I am. And I'm I'm not a princess. Princess is Usually are young and demure, and I'm here learning jujitsu. Like, like what? <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly. So I know, and I think we all have we all have like what we feel we want to say, right? Yes. Like I would want to say what she said. I would what want I'm to be saying. like, I ain't your baby girl, back, <laughs> right? And we all might be saying that inside, but we also do understand that these are relationships that we wanted to have to see every day. And if if if, it, if he feels embarrassed or if he feels so, we 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 respect that, right? We understand that we can't always just. You know, um, we, we don't always feel like we, we have yeah. every choice that we, you know, yeah. every every uh, every boundary setting tool available to us at any moment. So for me specifically, I think that based on your objective, which again, your objective is not that you're never going to see this guy again. It's group, you know, and um, bye, see you later, yeah. right? It's that you might be training with this person tomorrow or the next day. You might actually really appreciate the value that they're bringing to you. You just don't appreciate that kind of, uh, of um, you know, in, of name calling or touching. And I think it can be done with all of the behaviors you stated, the touching and the, you know, and so I think when you kind of first acknowledge, look, I believe your intentions are in the right place and you can do that. And if you, especially if you actually believe that, that they're just kind of like misinformed and a little bit not understanding of how this can make a woman feel on the mats, um, you're coming at it from kind of more of an educating them standpoint, I think. And this is a very big cultural thing because there are different groups of people who do think that calling baby girl a sweet thing, like all these different things, especially in certain parts of the world where it is like 
a gentle, like, oh, it's actually a womanly like thing that the women love to be called that. That we're not saying that that's wrong. You just get to tell them what works for you, which is, goes back to saying your preference. You know, I prefer to not be using these um, kind of code names. Could you just use my name? Hey, Victoria. Uh, let's go work over here. And that doesn't address then the next part, which is teaching something to somebody in the midst of them trying to learn something else. This honestly would be a little aggravating for me because I actually care about it. I came to this class thinking this. So unless I have a separate relationship with that person where I said, hey, if you have extra stuff, let me know, I usually want to be focused on what's being taught. That being the case, I would be clear to say, oh yeah, thank you so much. Give me a second. I want to hear this. And it, it sounds very like small, but it's, it's showing them, you're, I hear you, but I'm going to silence you because I'm going to stay focused on this. Or if they try to interrupt or intersect a role, it's like, oh yeah, thank you. I want to learn that. Give me a second. I want to finish this. So be, staying focused, keeping on the focus of what's important to you is also a great strategy to not demoralize them, not have to point out how that they're intrusive, but they're like, you know, I'm here, I'm good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or, or, you know, I appreciate that you're trying to show these other techniques. However, I'd really like to focus on the ones that we just learned today because I'm still getting these down. So it's just a, you know, it's showing appreciation for potentially them willing to share information, sure. but it's still very clearly stating what you want. And whatever you want, you, you, can, you should be able to state. And if that means focusing on the technique that's at hand, if that means having um, less kind of uh, you know coaching through something in a, in a training session, you should be able to verbalize that. But I hope that helps in terms of just giving you some different strategies and skills. Um, you know, what and, I need to clarify. Mm. Um, so one of the, the examples I gave was on the mat, but a lot of what she's saying too can also be done off the mat. You do it, it happens, and you go afterwards. Hey, by the way, during class today mm -hmm. we did this thing. It might behoove you and or that person to find a separate space mm -hmm. and a separate, like, more private situation to say, point. how that kind of went down, it made me feel like this. And I know that that's not something that I've ever seen you do before, so this seems out of your behavior. But can we not do that on the mat anymore? I don't, it doesn't make me feel comfortable. Cool? Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great point. You might find a better opportunity to speak to somebody. Um, and let me just say this out loud. We don't owe it to anyone to save face, right? So it's not something that we owe them. Correct. It's what we owe ourselves and what we want. Again, this all comes down to what we want out of the situation. So I want, I think if we came in and said, no, hold your boundary no matter what, tell these guys, screw them and, and their egos, <laughs> and I would love to be able to approach it that way. Um, however, this, it's just not the world we, we live in. We understand that there's different, um, there's different elements in, at play. And you may have different desired outcomes from your situation, and yeah. that is okay. So it's just having grace and forgiveness with yourself in terms of your ways of approaching things. And maybe you've approached something, and then it didn't work out the way you want, and you go, oh gosh, now I have to go back. Yeah. And now maybe you need to eventually go back to that three-part statement. And so the first part, it maybe the first time you, you approach it, if you kind of give them, uh, again, a little bit of the benefit of the doubt, a little bit of expressing your appreciation for the other things that they contribute to the relationship, and you ask them, you know, not to use those names, and then they do it again, and that's when you might need to use this three-part statement and say, you know, I mentioned this to you before, but when you call me baby girl, it makes me feel a little bit, um, you know, like you can you enter whatever adjective it makes you feel, right? It makes me feel a little, it makes me feel like you don't respect me as a training partner and as a woman training here. I'd like you to stop using those names. Mm -hmm. So that's when the three-part statement can come in. Um, at any point, you can use that. I love it. Alia, were there any other um, questions or comments that we received during this hour that we can integrate into this? Um, there's a few. Okay. So, someone asked about um, how can CTCs help women in quarantine? Mm. Okay, the question was, how can CTCs help women in quarantine? That statement feels a little vague because there's an impl implied nature that women are needing help in quarantine. So I'm going to go ahead and assume some big things here. Mm -hmm. Are you assuming that these women in quarantine are in danger? Or does that make sense? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. There, there's many ways to help to help women in quarantine. The question is, yeah, exactly. So let's address a couple of those. If, sure. if in fact, there is a woman who's in quarantine that you are aware of, that is potentially in danger. Um, I have posted on my page before things that like, if you are being abused or um, whether it's emotionally or physically, to message me and ask me if I'm still selling my makeup. 
that will be an indicator to me that I need to check on you and make sure that you are doing it okay. Um, CTCs, if you know someone in your circle that is like this, you can sort of thread kind of like that, that is kind of under wraps and not saying, hey, are you being hit at home? Um, but really having some sensitivity to the fact that their messages might, might be being read, things might be happening. So maybe I can just put it out there now. If someone asks you to buy some makeup that you are still possibly selling, we can make that an indicator that mm, this is not necessarily, I don't sell makeup. That's a red flag, and maybe you should inquire if they are okay, in whatever way you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a great post. And then there was something like, if you ask me specifically about my eyeliner, I'll know to call the authorities or call, you know, and actually get help. So, you yeah. know, and, and that is um, just the unfortunate truth that right now, while both women and children are, and families are at home in quarantine stuck together, those who are in domestic violence situations are experiencing more violence, both children and um, you know, women and, and families that have domestic violence in their households. So it's a, a huge part of this, you know, this crisis that we feel like is not even really getting the full attention that it can, it deserves because there's kind of so much going on else going on with this. So anything that we can do, um, we're always posting re uh, resources as well for any kind of domestic violence hotlines. Yeah. And uh, there's, you know, there's other ways to support, but it's a, it's a very challenging one right now because we can't physically be in the same space as other people. And they can't get physically somewhere else to safety. Yeah. So the other one that I'm in taking this is if a woman is in quarantine, the only other danger or the other help that I can imagine she, she might need is that against her own mind. And that just leads me to the mental health crisis that I think is a small bubbling um, thing that is coming up with everyone being isolated by themselves. I've always believed that our mind can be our biggest, you know, help or our biggest hindrance. And that is because the untamed mind will go to the dark depths of everywhere and its imaginations and all the movies that we've seen and how we're desensitized to things like The Walking Dead. So I'm like, it's happening right now. So it's important that if, if you are talking about helping someone who is in isolation or quarantine, um, with their mental health or against themselves, um, this is a deeper help, and we also sometimes post um, support on uh, psychologists and therapists that are at a, a phone call away. Um, one of our students in Beverly Hills Sage just created a platform called Try Frame, and it is a platform that allows a digital access to therapists and mental health professionals. Mm -hmm. They also hold digital workshops that allow you to sit in on them and just be viewing some of the things that they're offering so that you don't necessarily have to have this one-on-one -on -one engagement. But I, I definitely can relate to and feel the pains of the mental health challenge as I've had my own traumas in my past and they, per, they persist and they sometimes bubble up in isolated times, in stressful times, in quarantine times. So um, for those CPCs who can, um, Keelan is doing something beautiful right now where he's trying to call different students that maybe come up on, on some things. So maybe you can call some of your students out of nowhere and just kind of see how they are. Just kind of check in. How's your mental health going? How's your training going? Where is your heart and do you feel alone? What can we do? I also like, we talked about last week, drive by highs. Sometimes it's good to see some physical energy in real life. Mm -hmm. Drive by some of your students if you're close with them. <laughs> Don't be creepy. That'd be weird if you're just talking. <laughs> and we love that we just have these um, you know, instructors all over there just like deployed and offering this program and uh, as resources to the global community out there. So we appreciate all you CTC instructors and women power instructors out there. Yeah. Um, and anything else that you feel like you want to wrap up on this? I don't. I think that, um, again, we can, we, there's so we much to talk about day, guys. and we'll, we're happy to take any other questions and any that we see, I think we can post over the next weeks or we can talk about next time, but I know that there's um, a lot of like, there are so, a lot of boundary setting situations that require a little bit of like really figuring out and analyzing because we, like we said, they're all different. They're all going to be different situations. And, mm -hmm. and boundaries are, are really, are just a worth game. You have to believe you're worth defending and boundaries are a form of self-defense. So if you can sit with the fact that I am worth this, I am worth saying no to something, then all of these boundaries will work to your favor. And that's the deepest, hardest thing to connect to sometimes. So you're worth it. You are. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope to see you again next week. Next week.